Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, with your propaganda watch for this week. And, uh-oh, it looks like the Department of Energy has a bit of explanation to do, or more specifically, the National Nuclear Security Administration, run by the DOE. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this. Don't fear the Green Reaper. The Department of Energy's creepy recycling mascot is here to save the day, according to Motherboard, which reports on the unsettling costume that was dreamt up by an employee at the agency that oversees America's nuclear stockpile. And here you can see the lovable Green Reaper here reaping the uh, the current crop of children to get them on board with sustainable energy or something like that. Uh, reading from the report, nothing says sustainable energy like a green-clad Grim Reaper waving a flower-shaped scythe at children and, de and demanding their promise to recycle on behalf of the government agency in charge of the nuclear stockpile. This is one of the very jobs of the Green Reaper, the U.S. Department of Energy's horrifyingly adorable mascot. As first spotted by Reason, Freedom of Information Act requests from journalist Emma Best to reveal that America's nu reg nuclear regulatory body decided to use the Green Reaper to raise awareness of sustainability goals, successes, and best practices. It's an odd makeover for death to do don green robes and take a government paycheck to promote recycling on behalf of America's nuclear cops. Still, the mascot isn't as odd as it may sound. The DOE oversees energy production and conservation in addition to the handling of all nuclear materials. So spreading information about sustain sustainability is in its purview. And it goes on to give information about how this Green Reaper came to be. And uh, it talks about some of the events that, uh, that it goes to to promote sustainability and encourage bus ridership and other such things. What a bizarre... Seemingly out of nowhere non sequitur. Why, why on earth is there this Grim Reaper character representing sustainability? And we may laugh at the humorous idea of some sort of green-clad Grim Reaper l watching over these this next harvest of children with his green scythe, but uh, maybe it's not, nothing to laugh about. Yes, in addition to adding to the list of the not quite complete list of things supposedly caused by by global warming, such as uh, rising popcorn prices and killer cornflakes and literally Hitler. We can add climate grief, climate grief to that list of things caused by global warming. What is this about? Oh, it's about the growing emotional toll of climate change. And this story filed last December, starts by noting that when the UN released its latest climate report in October, it warned that without unprecedented action, catastrophic conditions could arrive by 2040. For Amy Jordan, 40, of Salt Lake City, a mother of three teenage children, the report caused a crisis. The emotional reaction of my kids was severe, she told NBC News. There was a lot of crying. They told me we know what's coming and it's going to be really rough. She struggled, too, because there wasn't much she could do for them. I want to have hope. The reports are showing that this isn't going to stop, so all we can do is cope. The increasing visibility of climate change, combined with bleak scientific reports and rising carbon dioxide emissions, is taking a toll on mental health, especially among young people, who are increasingly losing hope for their future. Experts call it, cl experts call it climate grief depression, anxiety, and mourning over climate change. Last year, the American Psychological Association issued a report on climate change's effect on mental health. The report primarily dealt with trauma from extreme weather, but also recognized that gradual long-term changes in climate can also surface a number of different emotions, including fear, anger, feelings of powerlessness, or exhaustion. And it goes on to talk about all of the latest scaremongering before noting that uh, this woman was able to find help in a 10-step program for climate grief. After the UN report was released, Jordan looked for a way to help her children cope. She saw a sign at her church for a support group that deals with the issue, the Good Grief Network. Founded by Amy Rowe, 30, and Laura Schmidt, 32, Good Grief offers a 10-step program to help people deal with collective grief. Issues that affect a whole society, like racism, mass shootings, and climate grief. An interesting mix there. The program runs as a 10-week cycle, each weekly meeting tackling a different step. It's currently in its third cycle in Salt Lake City and is also running online. The steps encourage participants to confront their climate fears and sadness and acknowledge that they are part of the problem as polluters in a carbon-fueled system 
but also find the motivation and strength to be part of the solution. It goes on from here. I'll let you read through the whole report if you are so inclined. And of course, I will throw a link into the actual APA report that talked about climate uh, health, mental health and our changing climate uh, impacts, implications and guidance from March 2017 that talks about the impact of climate change on people's mental health. Some human health effects stem directly from natural disasters exacerbated by climate change. Other effects surface more gradually from changing temperatures and rising sea level that cause forced migration. Weakened infrastructure and less secure food systems are examples of indirect climate impacts on society's physical and mental health. And they go on to talk at great length and in great detail about how climate grief is becoming a very real thing. But let's concentrate on one particular aspect of this manufactured problem that is being pumped 24-7 through the mainstream media, uh, which is a big hint, ding, 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 that maybe there's something more going on here than the dispassionate objective reporting of reporters, journalists who just want to get to the facts about science. (laughs) Maybe there's something more going on here, like the indoctrination of an entire generation of children And this is where the Green Reaper stops being quite the funny, sort of silly, oh, isn't this a silly waste of government money, into something much more fundamentally disturbing. And in what way? Well, in order to understand that, we only have to look at something like this. No need to make horror films anymore. Look what is being done to our children. And the link here is to the School Strike for Climate Save the World video from TEDx, the TEDx talk by... Greta Thunberg of, uh, I believe the organization is called uh, No More Time? Uh, Need More? We Don't Have Time. Yeah, I knew it was something along those lines. Something appropriately scaremongering. So for people who don't know about Greta Thunberg and the incredible 100% propaganda push that is on right now to indoctrinate children and then recruit them into the climate cult striking for action and all of this. And what is it really at root of this? I'm going to point to a very important series of reports on wrongkindofgreen.org, The Manufacturing of Greta Thunberg, which is a six-act, six-part investigative series looking not just at Greta Thunberg and what she is doing, the part she is playing in spreading this propaganda and further traumatizing an entire generation of children into believing there's only 12 years left and we're all going to die. And who is really behind this organization, the We Don't Have Time organization. And it's an incredible story that I won't do justice to by just summarizing and giving bits and pieces here and there, but suffice to say, there are massive mega corporations with massive amounts of funding, very politically connected, that are trying to access $100 trillion worth of pension investments as part of a global Ponzi swindle that is taking place right under our nose. And with the use of children who are being traumatized as part of a propaganda conditioning push. This is... Insanity. This is objectively, this is insanity. What is being done to the children of this day and age regarding this, appropriately enough, this uh, this 12, 10-step program for overcoming climate grief and other collective grief issues being advertised in a church, because this is the modern religion that people are being indoctrinated into, where The climate polluters, the sinners, we all, there's original sin. Being born and breathing oxygen means that you are sinning. There's only one way to atone for that, uh, other than, you know, killing yourself. But the, the only way to atone to that, of course, is to pay your carbon tithes to the masters of this system. It's incredibly insidious how deep this propaganda conditioning goes into the psyche of human beings and what makes them tick. There is a reason that religious institutions have flourished throughout human history. It is because there are certain basic psychological motivations that are played on, and these are the exact motivations that are being played on here. Climate grief and uh, the, uh, the, the shame over our original carbon sin is a propaganda construct that is being woven around us. 
And do you remember? I mean, this is not this is not something new, and this is not coming out of nowhere. This is something that's been developing for years and years and years, and being pushed as part of a concerted propaganda effort, which included. Do you remember several years ago when one of these we don't have time like climate action uh, groups put out a humorous little propaganda campaign where they were going around saying anyone who doesn't want to participate in the recycling programs or whatever it is, I mean, that's that's fine, no pressure, but we will kill you and your children if you don't go along with that. Oh, <laughs> oh what a funny little ad campaign. Do you remember that ad campaign? Because Pepperidge Farm remembers. A UK global warming activist group hoping to kick off their new initiative to encourage people to reduce their carbon emissions by 10% per year has faced fierce backlash over a promotional video for their campaign. The video features an imaginary scenario in which everyone who does not volunteer to join the campaign is killed in a violent and bloody explosion. Targets of the grisly explosions, which show the victims' bodies torn apart and splattered blood and body parts covering all of the eco-friendly onlookers, include office workers and even school children. Now, no pressure at all, but it'd be great to get a sense of how many of you might do this. Just a rough percentage. That's fantastic! And there's not... Philip and Tracy. That's fine, that's absolutely fine. Your own choice. Okay, class, thank you so much for today, and I will see you all tomorrow. Oh! Just before you go, I just need to press this little button here. Now, everybody, please remember to read chapters 5 and 6 on volcanoes and glaciation. Except for Philip and Tracy, of course. The short film ends with another grisly act of eco-slaughter, with the victim's r remains splattering the screen and the campaign slogan, No Pressure, being written literally in the victim's blood. Unsurprisingly, the video was pulled from the campaign's webpage and YouTube channel as thousands of comments and emails flooded in decrying the overt advocacy of genocide inherent in the ad. In a press release posted on the campaign's website, the organizers write, quote, With climate change becoming increasingly threatening and decreasingly talked about in the media, we wanted to find a way to bring this critical issue back into the headlines whilst making people laugh. Many people found the resulting film extremely funny, but unfortunately, some didn't, and we sincerely apologize to anybody we have offended. End quote. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, extremely funny. Oh, wasn't it so funny when those children exploded and their blood and guts went all over their classmates because they refused to participate in the global warming climate cult and its rituals? <laughs> oh, child sacrifice. Such a knee slapper. Gets me every time. What are these people thinking? What is wrong with these people's brain that that would even occur to them as something to... They just make a nice, light-hearted little ad for our little propaganda campaign to promote our cult. Why would anyone do that? It's because this is not some random idea or image that just came to some stupid marketer someday. This is a core part of the ideology that is indoctrinating an entire generation into a system of beliefs and, more importantly, practices that will remain with them throughout their life. If the propagandists and the would-be social engineers have their way. Again, this is not by coincidence, this is by design. Someone who hit the no nail right on the head about this subject very recently is PreviousCorporateReport.com guest Jeffrey Tucker, who wrote this essay, The Socialists Always Come for the Kids, Eventually. And I don't think he even probably realizes exactly how right he is in this article, but he does hit the nail squarely on the head, pointing out AOC in her sweet potato video makes a passing remark that suggests some anxiety about whether people ought to have kids. And he goes on to relate this to the anarchy of human production and ultimately how eugenics is still with us and how ultimately one thing that a central planner cannot abide is the anarchy of human production. People deciding when and how to have children and having children on their own without state intervention? Oh, we can't have that. We're going to have to start limiting people's 
human production, which is why it always comes down to that in the most hardcore of hardcore centrally planned economies, like in communist China and other places. There will be literal laws on the books about how and when and how many children you can have. And do you not think that is coming? Do you not think this is where this conditioning, this climate grief propaganda is going? Because I'm telling you, it is. In fact, if you've been following the news lately, it's already here. Sticking with the environment, there is a growing group of women who say they are on a birth strike. They're too scared, they say, to have children because of what they call ecological Armageddon. Let's meet some of them in an exclusive TV interview. Blythe Papino, who is here. She's the founder of Birth Strike, and Alice Brown, who's 25, and says she's so scared about the future of the planet, it's actually actually debilitating for her. Welcome, both of you. Um, why are you on Birth Strike, Blythe? Um, because I'm terrified. Um, and that's putting it mildly. Um, so our planet is in a kind of collapse. The natural world is collapsing around us and that's actually happening right now. Um, and I'm so disappointed by um, the response by our authorities to this crisis um, and so freaked out by it. Um, everything that I've read um, that I've, I've basically last year I came to the decision that I couldn't bring a child into that um, and I was asking around um, people that I know put it a little bit out on Facebook and realized actually quite a lot of other people are making this decision mm. um, yeah and so we realized it was really really important to to tell the public that there are people out there that are so scared about this that they feel that they can't actually have a family and you have come to the same conclusion Alice yeah I have I'm um I mean, each day for me is is a struggle. I re I really do just. I'm so depressed. I feel so hopeless over how you know. I'm reading just in the last couple of months, even that you know, insect numbers are plummeting so fast. It now threatens the collapse of nature. Mm -hmm. That we're losing biodiversity. We're not losing. We're destroying biodiversity mm -hmm. so quickly that that threatens our food and, and the UN have said that that could lead to the risk of our own extinction. David Attenborough going on TV to say the collapse of civilization could come from this and I know that is so hard to really sit with and take in um, but I have done that and that has led to um, just a fear that I've never felt before and, and my decision for being on birth strike mostly has come from not wanting to pass that fear on to someone else. If, if we're in this situation now, you know, even since my parents had me, we've destroyed 60% of, of life on this planet. What would that be like when my child's my age? Will there be 10% left? That's not just to do with being, um, you know, a nature wildlife enthusiast like I am. That's actually, that's dangerous mm. as well. It's a life and death it is. situation. That's right. There is now something called the birth strike movement, which is encouraging women to refuse to have children because they believe the earth is in crisis due to climate change. Climate grief to literal carbon eugenics in one easy step. I really hope that this sounds familiar to you, because if it does, then thank you for having paid attention to me and what I've been screaming about for a literal decade now. It was a decade ago that I made my first video on carbon eugenics, trying to tie this together using the historical parallel that is there. In fact, it's not a parallel. It is literally the history of the modern environmental movement and the carbon eugenics movement from the literal eugenicists of old. I traced that history very carefully in why big oil conquered the world for those who didn't see it. It's a literal through line that goes from eugenics in the late 19th, early 20th century to the environmental movement and climate change in the late 20th and early 21st century towards technocracy, which will be the future of the 21st century. Uh, it, it's, it's right there in black and white, and this is how it's done, tying this thread through. It's all about 
directing the human population and controlling the human population in every sense, including, of course, the most literal sense now of literally encouraging people voluntarily, of course. It's all up to you, but we're going to die. The Earth is going to die in 12 years because we've just screwed everything up with our carbon sins, and every child that you put onto this planet is 568 tons of carbon dioxide per year added to our collective carbon guilt. And I know I'm not just pulling that number out of thin air. I'm going, of course, by the IPCC and its report on the world's climate trends, which just happens to note that having one child less per family will save 58.6 tons of CO2 per year. Because when I look at my children running around, growing up, learning, playing in the park, I think, oh, look at all that CO2 they're putting out onto this planet. Oh, it's so horrible. This is insanity, and it has to stop. We have to collectively snap out of it. And those of you who are awake and aware and understand this propaganda for what it is should be screaming from the rooftops about this. Do not go quietly into the good night as they literally march us into this technocratic eugenics enslavement grid in the name of the climate grief propaganda that they're shoving down our throats from birth with the Green Reaper and everything else. This is the game for all the marbles, and unfortunately, it is an exceptionally effective game that plays on our most fundamental psychological weaknesses. There's a lot more to be said about this, but of course, please do follow the notes, uh, follow the links from the show notes for this video so that you can discover more about this and really delve into the nitty gritty. Go to The Wrong Kind of Green, read about the manufacturing of Greta Thunberg, learn about the billions and billions and ultimately trillions of dollars that are on the line for big name, big stakes players in the economy to manufacture this, this new reality of climate grief and climate guilt and climate sin and climate tithing that is all being stitched together for us, and ultimately, of course, climate eugenics, which is the next stage in this game. I cannot stress enough how important it is, and if you have been affected by this propaganda conditioning, or you know people who are and are under the psychosis of this climate grief, know that this is a very well-understood psychological phenomenon called learned helplessness, where if you put someone in a situation and then tell them no matter what you do, no matter how you struggle, no matter anything that you do, you're still going to die a horrible death or you're going to receive pain or shock in some manner, well, that person is eventually going to give up. And that is where they want the population to give up. If you would like to overcome that, might I humbly suggest that you also take a look at the link in the show note that I'll put there to Overcoming Learned Helplessness, which was an episode of Corporate Report Radio back in the day. And I will have more to say on that particular subject in the near future. But uh, as I say, this is the game for all the marbles. And although the Green Reaper might come across your newswire and seem like just another silly story of government incompetence or waste, it's much more than that. And it goes to a very dark place. A place that none of us want to go. That's going to do it for this week. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com Available now from CorbettReport.com Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it. And the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power? in a post-carbon world. Heirs to an oil fortune join the divestment drive. There is a price to carbon in their future. The negative impact of population growth. That is important not only for the planet, it is important for the business. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in conservation? Yeah, the, the growing human population. How and why big oil conquered the world. Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at CorbettReport.com slash Big Oil.